I'm going to tell you about some of our recent work on interpreting deep neural network um, to extract mechanistic insights, and in this particular case, about how immune cell differentiation or rules of immune dif cell differentiation is encoded in the genome. Um, but before that, I wanted to give a higher level kind of introduction to the research that uh, we do. So in the last uh, five years since I've started my own lab, we've been really interested in questions that relate to genome interpretation. Um, so in one direction, which I'm actually not going to talk to you about, but happy to chat offline, is um, we've been really interested in understanding and predicting the impact of genetic variation across individuals on various types of cellular and phenotypic uh, traits. So examples include um, developing models for identifying the causal variants in rare disease setting from a huge number of other random variation that can occur across the genome. Um, also, uh, we've developed models for um, figuring out the propagated impact of genetic variation across multiple layers of gene regulation. And finally, more recently, um, we've kind of developed models for identifying and quantifying the joint impact of environmental factors and genetic uh, variation on various types of uh, phenotypes. And in this particular direction, what I think is really interesting from a computational standpoint is that we actually cannot experimentally measure all the relevant um, environmental factors that might matter, and we actually don't know what those would be. Um, so our twist to this is um, basically using what we can measure, which is um, gene expression and epigenomic data, to um, infer latent or unmeasured environmental factors in this context. And all of this is done by um, students um, and a lot. Um, so um, the direction that I'm actually going to talk to you about is um, uh, the question of how does the same genome get instantiated to uh, give rise to different cell types and di with different function, um, and in this particular um, talk about immune cell differentiation. And much of what you're going to hear is joint work with um, MGen Consortium um, and various um, students and postdocs along the way, which I'm going to highlight um, as we go through. And as Alex said, please um, feel free to interrupt as, as we're going through. Okay, so um, yeah, as I mentioned, the motivation goes back to this you know, fundamental question in biology, which is how is it that you know, in, in a single individual or a species, we have the same um, genome across many different, uh, that give rise to many different cell types. So this is a cartoon example of um, uh, immune um, cells where that are all arising from the same stem cell. So we know that they all have the same genome operating from the same blueprint, yet uh, we have reproducibly a distinct set of immune um, cells with um, specific characteristics that arise. So how does this come about? Uh, well, of course, we know a key uh, part of the answer to this question, which is um, differential usage of regulatory regions. The idea being that if you have different cell types, there's different regulatory regions that are being uh, used. These include promoters and enhancers. Um, and based on this differential regulatory uh, usage, um, different combinations of genes can be expressed. And that defines um, kind of cell state and function. So um, putting it more formally, you know, the basic hypothesis that unites all these um, kind of uh, principles that we know is that differential regulatory regions encode um, or allow for a representation of different um, sequence motifs that are important in different cell types. And those are the basis of differential gene expression. So a simple example would be, you know, the two cells, I'm, uh, two cell types I'm showing here, uh, you have different regulatory regions in each one. And um, if you analyze the sequences underlying these different regulatory regions, you might find different uh, motifs that we can represent. These are shorter sequences or short subsequent subsequences that we can represent with uh, these types of logos, um, oftentimes PWMs, um, and these um, you know, would be distinct for the sites that are different between, regulatory sites that are different between the two cell populations. So of course, this is um, a kind of a very um, simplistic picture. What we know is happening in reality is that it's not just one or two transcription factors or regulatory motifs that are distinguishing these cell types. Uh, but it's a pretty complex code, combinations and uh, different sets of um, regulatory motifs are, are um, probably present at each of these different regions, um, and this makes the problem pretty complicated. So um, as I mentioned, like, at, at, and we know enough principles to kind of think about the framework for how differences in cell types 
arise from the same genome, and that's based on differential interpretation or differential usage of regulatory regions. Um, but we don't know enough mechanistic in details um, and how this process actually works to um, answer um, key um, questions, um, which I phrased here. So uh, currently, it's, it's really hard to answer these what and why questions. So what question would be given a random region, even if you know it's regulatory, um, can we say which cell type it's regulatory in? So which cell type that, that region is important for? Um, and the second question, why question, would be even if you know a particular region is regulatory in certain cell type, what, why so? So what features are embedded in that region that makes it regulatory in some cell type and not others? So what is the logic of the sequence? Um, and as you can see here, kind of the way we're thinking about this problem is that at least to some extent, um, information about uh, which regions are active and which cell type is encoded in the genome itself and at least to the first approximation. So um, in the last um, decade or two decades, um, as you all know, there has been a revolution in measurement technologies and uh, you guys are all coming from Broad, you're at like, the center of all this um, stuff happening. Um, so this is uh, like a famous figure showing all the different technologies that have been developed for measuring all aspects of uh, gene regulation um, since uh, 2003. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that um, now we have access to technologies that could tell us or get us closer to answering this what question. So uh, we can apply all sorts of um, assays like CHIP-seq, ATAC-seq, DNA-seq, and so on to be able to at least say um, for a given regulatory region, which cell type is it likely to be regulatory in? And these technologies are being um, applied in large scale consortium efforts, some of which I've listed here that allow us to kind of get closer to answering these uh, what question, at least for major cell types um, that we know of. Um, but now what I'm going to focus this talk on is answering this why question. And data alone is not going to help us answer this why question. Data is a main ingredient, but we need model to go from you know, the raw data that we can generate to some sort of understanding of what makes certain region be active in certain setting and not in other settings. So um, for, for this, um, uh, the, 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 the major type of data that we're going to use here as part of um, this project that I'm going to tell you about is ATAC-seq. So I'm sure you guys will all um, know all about ATAC-seq, but at least for the sake of you know, having, having consistent terminology, I'll very briefly uh, mention a few things. And my cat is here and he keeps on going on my um, uh, keyboard, so I'm just gonna move it. All right, uh, so um, in an ATAC-seq assay, what we can do is for a given, now you can do it at single cell level, but at this time uh, we could do it for a population of cells. So we could collect a population of cell and then identify all regions that are chromatin free. So these open chromatin region with the major assumption that these open chromatin regions are likely to be regulatory active in that cell population. So um, basically what an attack seek assay, what gives us is that these um, um, annotation of, across the genome where we can say for that population of cell, which regions are likely to be regulatory. And then when we're talking about a population of cell, we have this quantitative signal that are shown usually at the height of the um, this like peaks here, uh, which you know we can interpret as the probability that that region is going to be open in that population of cell. So, um, and, and as proxy, uh, the regulatory probability of that region for that population. Um, so in terms of terminology, I'm going to define these regions that we identify with the ATAC-seq assay as OCRs or open chromatin regions. So as of a few years ago, what we could do uh, was to apply um, ATAC-seq to a handful of cells, uh, maybe four or five cells, and try to identify the regions um, that are different and regions that are shared and uh, do characterizations that way. Um, but what's been uh, really cool is that as technologies are maturing, they're being applied in large scale consortium efforts. Um, an example of this was done by um, the Immunological Genome Consortium, which I uh, was very fortunate to be able to contribute to. Uh, so what Imgen did was, well, first of all, what Imgen is, is a group of about 20 or so um, immunologists and a few computational biologists. And in this, um, the latest project that was um, uh, taken by Imgen, what they did was um, for um, generate or isolate uh, about 90 different immune cell types from adult mice. 
Uh, so these are essentially all immune cell type that immunologists agree upon that exist and are somewhat functionally distinct. Um, there might be more, but these are the well-characterized ones. Um, and um, that can be isolated. Um, and for each of these immune cell types, they generated um, a toxic profile and triplicates. Um, and uh, this was, you know, this was a really huge um, scale experiment feasible because there was 20 or so immunological labs all specializing on different kinds of immune cell types. Uh, and, and I'm showing what I'm showing you here is this um, dendrogram of the relationship between the immune cell types that were captured. So we have the stem cells here, and then you have the different immune lineages that you might heard of, and then within each um, lineage there are um, subtypes. Um, and yeah, and just to mention, so this was, you know, the effort was spearheaded by, by Christoph Benua, um, Jason Van Rustro, um, and myself on the um, computational side. So um, with this data, uh, what it boils down to is that um, now um, we defined uh, about 500,000 open chromatin regions or peak across all these cell types in the immune system. So in a sense, we can say we have a good representation of regions that are potentially regulate, regulatory across the entire um, immune system. And then for each one, we have some sort of quantitative signal that tells us which um, cell types that region is um, regulatory in. Okay, so um, kind of the first pass uh, of analysis of this data that was um, done um, when the data first was generated was really characterizing, um, you know, which regions are active and which cell types. So more along answering the what question. But what I wanna talk about now is using the same data to go further and try to answer the why question on the basis of sequence identity underlying these attack peaks or OCRs that we've identified, can we figure out the logic um, that says why certain regions are active in certain cell types and not others? And maybe let me just uh, make sure if there are questions up to this point, I'm, I'm happy to take. So no questions from the chat, uh, but if somebody has a question, I, I hope they unmute themselves and ask it now. Otherwise, it's super interesting. I can't wait to hear how you attack the why question. <laughs> okay, so let's go further then. Um, okay, so for, for context, let me just um, kind of mention how you would solve this problem classically, uh, as in you know, this, this kind of classical approach has existed for the last 40 years or so. Um, so what you could do classically, and I'm sure all of you have done something like this at some point, um, is to uh, do motif analysis with the idea that, you know, we can take all regions, regulatory regions that are um, active in a cell type of interest and not um, in other cell types, so some sort of stratification of the peaks, and try to look for either uh, short k-mers or known motifs that are overrepresented in a population of interest. And then from this come up with a list of you know, motifs that we think are important uh, that create the basis for why certain regions are active in certain cell type. So this is all uh, fine if you have a small number of comparison to make, like if you just you know, care about comparing two cells, but you can imagine once you're talking about 90 different immune cell types that are um, very similarly linked and um, lot with lots of similarities, it's gonna become really hard to just sort of stratified analysis. So really like this kind of like brute force analysis is gonna destroy the beauty and the continuity of this data that uh, we've captured. Um, and in particular, one uh, problem um, that we need to address is that cell types that are close by together in this dendrogram are gonna share majority of their regulatory sites. And this wasn't obvious to us when we started looking at the data, how much sharing act is actually going on. Um, so to um, exemplify that, what I'm showing you here is two cell types that are, you know, um, next door neighbors to each other. So um, T naives and T regulatory cells. And each dot here is, you know, um, the attack signal from one region. So there should be 100,000 or so uh, dots here for 100,000 or so regulatory regions that are active in either of these two cell types. Um, and then I'm showing the signal. Um, so you can see, um, you know, majority of regulatory regions that are present in either of these are active in both to some extent. It's a small number that are differentially active in one cell type versus the other. And like the, the, the signal is pretty continuous in, in some way. So um, because we have this situation like this, it's really hard to do this 
a stratified analysis or any kind of binary or multi um, label um, discrete prediction because it's, there's a lot of noise um, if you want to actually fit, assign regions to cell types. So um, a completely different way of looking at this is through the lens of uh, machine learning. And the idea would be that, can we train a machine learning model that takes as input these sequences that underlie our, our, our regulatory regions? Um, and in this particular case, they're about 200 base pair long. And can we develop a machine learning model and train it so that on the basis of the sequence can predict the activity profile, the attack activity profile across um, our cell types? So um, if we develop a, mo a model like this, um, then we can um, answer a really cool question. And, and the thing that I wanted to highlight is that you know the first time, so this we started this project, actually this was you know a, a three or four a year long project. Um, and we start, we started discussing it. Um, I remember our immunologist collaborators um, were all kind of confused that why do you want to make prediction? We actually assume that we know about, um, you know, if you give us a sequence, we can just look up that sequence and say which cell type it is active. And we have like you're assuming we have complete data here. What's the use of this model? Um, and I'm sure it's it's obvious to you guys. Um, two kind of deep reasons why it's interesting to do this. Um, first is that if you really have a model that learns a general, generalizable logic about the relationship between sequence and cell type profile across these cell types, um, you have an opportunity to dissect this model to, to see what did it learn, how does it know um, how to go from sequence to activity profile, and maybe we can learn something about how uh, biological regulation works. Um, and the second and um, kind of second motivation, which actually I'm not going to um, go into detail, but that's something that we're also working on is um, in silico um, mutagenesis. So the idea would be that if we have such a model, then we can introduce all sorts of mutation to the input sequences and ask hypothetical questions. What would happen if we had a mutation in this um, C2G? Um, does that change the regulatory activity um, across these cell types? So, um, uh, so one thing that I'm going to um, have here is that we want to have a nonlinear high capacity function here, which is going to make this interpretation of you know, what has been learned a little bit difficult. So you might ask me, why do you want to have this um, complex model? Why can't we do something simple where it's going to be easy to interpret? Um, and kind of what I'm going to do here is justify this choice by citing three of my favorite papers that previously I've shown for this kind of task, um, nonlinear high capacity models do much better than simpler linear models. So uh, let me just briefly um, say what these are. And I, th I believe the authors of all of these papers have presented at MIA at some point or other. Um, so um, the kind of the work that I really um, inspired what we're doing was by David Kelly a few years ago um, that showed um, convolutional neural network, deep neural network are much better predictor of transcription factor binding compared to um, other even uh, complex met methods that don't have as much complexity like GK, uh, SDM. Um, and so in this task was very similar that starting from um, sequence, we want to uh, predict TF binding, right? In our case, we want to predict general attack activity. Um, so similar types of approaches have been shown to, to uh, do much better than um, linear or more simpler counterparts. Um, so, for instance, the, in chromatin state prediction from sequences and in RNA binding from um, input sequence data. Okay, so um, inspired by all of these work, um, we asked two questions. Um, so one is that, uh, so it's nice that you can actually, you know, use complex model to go from sequence to make predictions about chromatin state or transcription factor binding, but much of what existed was at the resolution of tissue or generic you know, binding versus not overall, and not um, at the cell type um, resolution that would really, um, we thought would be kind of the next stage of um, showing that we can, you know, how much information is embedded in sequence itself. So can we move beyond, you know, tissue specificity, which are um, kind of much more obvious to more high resolution um, cell type um, regulatory activity? And the second was that how can we robustly um, interpret parameters that are learned uh, from deep neural networks like this to try to figure out um, biological insights. So um, the model that we end up uh, using is a convolutional neural net, 
And I'm sure um, all of you have heard or used uh, or even um, kind of contribute to their development at some point. Um, but very briefly, um, so convolutional neural networks are um, used um, in a computer image, uh, computer vision um, a lot, and they've really revolutionized um, object detection and all sorts of things from images. Um, and there are two properties that makes them really nice for both images and sequences. Um, one is that um, they can detect um, features that, have, that are translational equivariants, meaning that you know, an ear can happen anywhere in the figure, uh, anywhere in the image, and the model will still figure out that that's uh, an ear. It doesn't have to be in a particular spot. And that's exactly what we're looking for in sequences. We were looking for shorter motifs that can happen anywhere. And the second reason, and more generally about neural network, why um, are very suitable in this task is that um, if you think about computer um, vision tasks, the, they can recognize different abstract representation of dogs. So these are all dogs. Um, and translating this to you know, why, why, why they would perform well in our sequence case is that there's not one logic for why a particular region is going to be active in B cells. There could be different logic going on. So, and they'll have enough capacity to be able to um, capture that. So, um, so we're going to talk about um, interpreting them. Uh, so I wanted to come back to this example from computer vision. What do we know about you know, how um, deep neural network or convolutional neural network um, actually learn? Um, so the idea is that you have these different hidden layers and nodes in these different hidden layers um, learn different abstract representations. So on the first layer, um, typically it's believed that these nodes are learning about edges that are present. And then the deeper layer are um, learning higher level um, abstract representations like maybe ears, nose, and tails. And then these deepest layers are putting together all of these different um, representations um, that, or features that are learned in the lower layers to make a final prediction. So how would this pan out in the case of um, sequences? Well, the idea is that um, if we feed in the sequence to the model, um, the first layers are going to learn about short sequence motifs or learn to detect or scan for short sequence motifs that are represented by these uh, weight matrices um, learned by each of these uh, first layer nodes. Um, and then these um, motifs um, or the representation of them uh, that are learned in the first layer are going to be combined in the second and the later layers to create some sort of um, embedding of these sequences and this um, kind of um, um, lower dimensional space or higher dimensional depending on um, the parameters set in for this layer. Um, and on the base of this representation in this uh, embedding space, the models are going to make some sort of prediction about whether or not that sequence is active in a particular cell type. So um, going back to our um, you know, MGen um, data set, what we did was train this um, convolutional neural network um, which I'm going to um, kind of go through the details um, in the next uh, little bit. Uh, so um, the idea is that our model takes as input these um, sequences underlying um, OCRs. They're typically 200 base pair long. And we encode them, we encode them using binary encoding. Um, then the model has three convolutional layers here and two fully connected layers. And it's a multitask uh, learning model, meaning that we're going to make a prediction about um, ATAC activity in all of um, the cell type, 90 cell types at once. I remember that I mentioned each peak, basically, uh, we have some sort of quantitative um, signal, uh, which is the height of the peak for each of these um, cell types. Everything good so far? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, and then a few more details on um, the uh, architecture of the model. So. Um, I mentioned that we have these three convolutional layers here, two fully connected layers. Um, it turned out that a model that had about 300 neurons in the first layer, each being 19 base pair long, uh, worked the best. But what I wanted to mention is that there is um, there was no magic to this. It's, it's kind of there's a lot of wiggle room uh, for different um, kind of parameter setting actually uh, work. But what we thought was more important was oh. Um, Right. Uh, so one thing before I tell you what was more important is that um, so we have because we framed this in a multitask um, learning framework. So we have this shared layer, uh, which is basically um, these features that are learned 
um, that are important for the union of all these um, outcomes we want to predict. And then we have these task specific layer or cell type specific layer uh, that uses different combinations of these features that are learned to make prediction about um, the activity profile of each input sequence. Um, right, so you know, I mentioned that, um, so we have certain setting of the parameters which turn out to actually be very similar to some of the previous um, convolutional neural networks that have been trained on sequence data for predicting chromatin state. Um, but what we thought um, actually made a bigger difference was the form of the loss function you use to measure the error of the model. So during training, um, the, the model is gonna update its parameter um, based on you know, how much error it's making currently on uh, training predictions. Um, and depending on how we formulate the loss function, um, certain errors are gonna be more important than others. And in our case, and what we thought worked pretty well is if we use um, correlation um, between prediction and output as a measure of a loss. So what I mean by that is, so when a model predicts um, a vector of you know, 90, um, a, a 90 uh, dimensional vector uh, for each correspond to prediction for each cell type, we can measure the correlation between um, this prediction and the ground truth um, for that particular example. And that correlation essentially ser serves as a loss to say um, how well did we do on, on that task. And uh, the reason why uh, this works, we thought that it worked well, was that uh, it's essentially emphasizing the model's ability to predict um, which cell types are going to be more active versus not for a given input sequence. Um, and this was um, a little bit emphasis more on, so I, you know, I brought up this, um, the problem that we have this class imbalance issue where um, regions that are differential for specific cell types are going to be rare. Uh, and this particular loss function allows us to some extent emphasize that we need to be able to predict well on regions that are have a lot of variability, meaning that they are active in certain cell types and not in others. So uh, just a small question. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned class imbalance in a certain sense, but I was just thinking about class imbalance in another sense, like of the 90 different cell types, what if um, one is you just have very little data and it's just very hard to put this, would you try and weight somehow that entry in the Pearson correlation thing like more? Yeah, than that? yeah totally, that's a great point. So uh, <laughs> one thing about this data <clears throat> is that MGen consortium is really heavy on T cell people. Um, so lots of the cell types out of the 90 are um, variants or subtypes of T cells. Um, and so there, there is class imbalance and, and we've done various things to try to see how we address this. Um, one would be exactly what you mentioned, you know, try to weigh in um, the different cell types depending on, you know, to kind of make them look balanced. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to present results on that because all of that is kind of like um, ongoing investigations, but that, those are, yeah, great things to explore. I also have a quick question, sir. Sure. Uh, this is Brian. So, on, yeah, on the previous slide, so when you calculate the error, um, so that's done, the correlation is being calculated kind of on a site-by-site -site basis. As exactly. To, yeah, exactly. Okay, great. So one, one way I think to think about it would be like, if you just looked at either all the data smashed together across sites or looking even on a site-by-site -site basis, but just looking at the L2 norm, you could get a good score if you just learned which things tended to have high bars versus tended to have low bars without actually capturing any of the dynamics across. Exactly, you, you, yeah, it, that's exactly right. And that's why, you know, the more standard thing to do <clears throat> would be something like mean squared error, which is like L2 loss. Um, <clears throat> and if you um, do that, essentially you will end up predicting sites that are generally high everywhere um, because the sites that are generally high everywhere tend to actually uh, be ubiquitous. Well, I mean, that's the definition, um, but you know, the model cares more about getting those right as opposed to sites that are more variable and tend to overall have lower signal. Um, okay, so how does how does it actually do? And this is something you know I, I really didn't know before we started exploring this model. Uh, we don't know how well we can go from sequence to this granular granular cell type activity uh, prediction. 
<clears throat> so one way to do this to assess how well the model actually worked is by using you know, standard cross-validation. So in this uh, particular figure that I'm showing, what we did was um, use 90% of the, the initial um, OCRs or peaks for training, um, leave out 10% of them for testing. And as I mentioned, you know, one intuitive thing that we can measure about one metric we can use is correlation between prediction and the actual magnitude of the um, ATAC signal. So um, this um, histogram here, the orange one is um, the correlation between all these you know, examples between prediction versus ground truth uh, for all the um, OCRs or peaks that were uh, part of the test set. And one thing that you can see is that um, you know, if, if there was just null prediction, we would have a correlation of zero, some, some histogram here center at zero, uh, but it's shifted. So for a good number of these test OCRs, we're able to make accurate prediction. If you want to put some statistics on it, um, something about 60% of um, these OCRs on the test data are predicted with um, statistical significance in terms of correlation between output and um, actual ground truth. And then so we can see, okay, so what happens, um, like what would, uh, what, what would be a null model to, to evaluate how, how good these are would be. So one thing one can do is shuffle data. So um, in a very simple null model, we can shuffle the cell type identity, so the labels and, and say, um, you know, do we see what we would expect, which is zero correlation. That's true. Another kind of null model we can have is uh, shuffle the sequence, um, input sequences and, and see how well it does. Again, it would be something um, like this, which I'm not showing you here, but um, it's in uh, the paper. So we've done various kind of uh, shuffling to see, you know, is it really that if you have random data, we get random output back. So here's an, an example of a prediction that worked really well. And this has kind of got me excited um, that we actually have cell type resolution. So this is for one particular input sequence. This is the observed ground truth. So there's about 90 bars here for the ATAC signal across these 90 different immune cell types. I've labeled them by the lineage that they belong to. And uh, this is the prediction for that um, left out um, test sequence. Um, so what you can see is that generally this particular sequence is active in cell type in T cells, but even within T cell, there's a large amount of variability and the model is tend to getting this uh, variability uh, really right, which was uh, kind of really encouraging when we first saw this a few years ago. So the other thing that I wanted to mention um, kind of um, related to Brian's point is that um, now we can say, so we have this model with a Pearson loss function. Uh, what would have happened if you were to train a model with something like mean squared or L2 um, loss, which would be more conventional? So what I'm showing you here is um, prediction on one, like each dot is one test um, OCR or one test peak. And you can say the, the error that the MSC model made versus um, the correlation. So it's kind of the axes are, you have to think about them because um, larger error is bad, but larger correlation is good. Um, but the point that I wanted to make here was that, you know, there is a bunch of um, test sequences here where we're making good predictions with um, the correlation model. Um, and if you, you know, color code them and, uh, by the variance in the attack signal, we see that they're generally high variance site. Um, and, and especially these are the high variance site, the MSE model tend to get wrong um, because it's tend to focus on regions like here. So there's a bunch of OCRs here that are not very variable. They're pretty ubiquitous. Um, the, MSC, the MSC model is doing well on them. And then you can also um, look at um, stratified uh, the predictions on prediction made on um, this more distal sites or more enhancer sites versus promoters. And then we see that our model is actually doing much better on distal sites. Um, so these are correlations on the x-axis and this is kind of variance um, across several uh, instances of, of the trained model. Um, and so we're doing generally better on enhancers compared to promoters, which tend to be more ubiquitous. Um, so I, I guess there's just one comment here that is just telling us that different logic is needed to learn more ubiquitous versus more cell type specific um, regulatory signal from sequences. So this was all nice. Um, Cross-validation is kind of a nice first check, but um, for all your machine learning practitioners, you know that cross-validation is not the end of the story. And oftentimes how, no matter how careful we are, when we move on to a new data set, things kind of fall apart. Um, so in this case, um, what we decided to do was um, to do um, to apply our model um, to assess its performance on a much harder 
um, you know, independent data set. And the idea was that, so all the data that was generated was from uh, mouse immune cell types. Uh, we got lucky that it turned out that there was a human counterpart to this um, project that was published a few years ago, um, where for, you know, same kind of protocol attack seek assay was used across 23 immune cell types in human. Um, and very similar kind of parameter setting was used to extract um, peaks and OCRs and quantify um, the magnitude. So what we did was essentially just take all these data without doing anything. So 400,000 regions that were defined in human and feed them um, to our trained model that's only seen mouse sequences and ask you know, how well can we predict these immune cell types in humans. And I should say out of these 23, there was about 18 that overlapped with the uh, mouse uh, cell types that we had. So we can do a direct comparison for um, a, a portion of the sub, uh, cell types that we had in mouse. So this is essentially what we saw. So this is um, correlation in predicting these 18 cell types that overlapped. Um, this um, orange histogram versus um, the blue one, would be, which would be um, a shuffle data. Um, so again, you see the shift. And obviously, it's not as good as the shift that we saw in the mouse data um, because there are going to be some differences. Uh, but it was really encouraging to see that there are um, actually sensible predictions for a good number of human OCRs. And um, just for context, I wanted to highlight that this is a really hard problem to go from human to mouse when we're talking about regulatory regions. So if you go on the basis of just raw sequence alignment using like a tool like Liftover, only about 10% of regulatory regions in human and this particular data align to mouse human with like pretty good correspondence. Um, so it's not just um, the entire sequence underlying OCRs that match, but subsequences within and motif within it that are gonna be um, encoding the generalizable logic that the model has learned. Um, uh, so just in passing, I also wanted to mention that um, so what would, so are there a lot of regulatory differences in mouse and human? What would have happened if we trained the model on human? Do we do much better than this? And our conclusion was that, um, no, this tends to be the limit of how well we can do on either human or mouse data. So if you know, train a model on, on human and apply it to a test sequence versus use the mouse train model and apply it to the test, the same test sequence, this is what we get is pretty correlated. So sequences that are predicted by well by the mouse model are also predicted well by the human model and so on. Sarah, I think maybe you already mentioned, but I was wondering if you can expand or repeat for my sake. Uh, in those no distributions with the shuffled data, uh, I remember in the previous case, it was a very narrow Gaussian. Yeah. Uh, why, uh, why is this one so much? Or actually, I thought the other one was suspiciously narrow. Uh, so yeah. In any case, why are they different? What do you think uh, contributes? Um, I, I think it's um, the, 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 there's a smaller number of cell types um, in human. And there is, um, so there's, you're just going to have more correlation. So it's easier to get them right like basically there's a small number of shufflings that you can do because essentially you have 18 versus you had 81 values that you could shuffle oh yeah that makes sense Thanks. yeah and and for you know the you know for the mouse data so we actually have one one plot that is um not as narrow and that is if you do sequence shuffling so we just shuffle the, the label of the cell types but if you sh um, shuffle the sequence content then then it'll be it will still be centered at zero but um be higher variance does okay. that imply that the significance wait i'm trying to process that thing that you just said so if you shuffle the sequence does that mean that the difference of the ground truth data is like less significant or something like less it just means that there is still logic in the basic nucleotide composition of the sequences yeah, yeah. Okay, good questions. Um, okay, so now that like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that the model has learned something interesting uh, and can make at least some um, predictions that are accurate at the cell type resolution level, we want to figure out how to interpret it to um, figure out what, what did it learn about um, relationship between sequence and regulatory activity. Uh, and this is, you know, a very active area of machine learning research, interpreting deep neural network. And there's probably over a hundred uh, different you know, papers that are coming out each year in top venues in, in machine learning on the topic of how to interpret complex models in general. Um, and just for our sake, we can kind of view these as um, the different interpretation method 
under um, essentially three categories of what you, how you're trying to interpret model. There's a class of methods that do activation maximization, uh, meaning that they're just trying to generate, and I'll, I'll talk about it in the case of images because it's easier to describe, um, for a particular neural network, generate images that maximally result in a particular um, output. And by that, we can figure out, okay, what was in the maximally activating image? And that gives us some insight about what is the neural network um, finding. There, there's a whole host of feature attribution methods that try to say for a given input sequence, what are the pixels or what are the positions that are important uh, for making the final prediction? And th this way, at least for an um, example by example basis, we can say what were the important features. Um, and a sec a third class, uh, which I'm mainly going to talk about, uh, is kind of like how we would probe a biological system, basically by ablation and knockout kind of things. Uh, so you would say, I'm going to remove one node and see how that uh, impacts the output and how that impacts the kind of errors that we're, make, uh, we're making and then try to figure out um, what's going on in that model. So, uh, and just briefly to say, we, you know, we've dabbled into all of, all of these, but the thing that is most important um, is to account for uncertainty in the parameters that are learned. And once we do that, much of, at least on this particular data, much of the features that we can extract are shared between all these different approaches. Uh, so the thing that makes the, makes the bigger difference is the uncertainty in the parameters that are learned. Um, okay, so um, let me just uh, briefly tell you um, kind of our um, first um, approach to this, uh, which consists of three steps. So what we're gonna do is first talk about, you know, interpreting the first layer nodes, what do they learn? So these are often referred to as filters. Uh, so for each node, we can figure out what are the training or test sequences that are maximally activating um, that node and come up with some sort of PWM logo that says, you know, this is um, the logo that most activates this particular node. You have 300 of those, so uh, we're gonna have 300 of these um, kind of logos. Then in the second step, what we're gonna do is remove that, that node by setting its value to mean value um, and seeing how much error we're making when we remove that node. So that's a way to um, give us the importance or the influence of that feature. And the third step, uh, which I thought was the most important, um, was to uh, try to repeat these process across different uh, training instances of the same model on the same data. So the, the two things that are very is that we're gonna just subsample um, the training data. So given um, you know 90% of the, the data is gonna be training um, data. Um, and then the, we're gonna have different in, um, initialization of the parameters. So these are gonna be 10 you know, distinct models that are learned from the same data. And then what we're gonna ask is that, how many times do we find the same uh, motif or the same you know, PWM across these different 10 models? So that's a way for dealing with uncertainty and the parameters that were learned, a very simple way to deal with it. Um, so um, doing this, um, basically what we can find is, um, so what I'm showing you here is, each dot here is one of these um, filters, and we have its motif representation that was learned. On the x-axis, we have sorry, we have information content, and on the y-axis, we have the influence of that particular motif and the final predictions of the model. And then what I'm showing you here is color coding them by the number of times out of the ten uh, where we found the same exact motif in different instances of the train model. Um, so the, the, the pattern that jumps out is that you know, the motifs that are most um, influential, so uh, above like certain, certain threshold here, are the ones that tend to be most reproducible. And um, just very briefly, if you go to a different way of interpreting the model and ask, so this particular case is deep lift, um, you know, do we find the same motifs? It turns out the motifs that are well reproduced are found again by deep lift and not the ones that are not um, well reproduced. Um, so one question that you can ask, so you know, what I showed you, these red dots, um, that's about 99 out of the 300 motif, um, filters in the first layer that we thought were reproducible. Um, so the question that you might have is, so why, you know, that just means that the model is over-parameterized. Why do you even learn 300 if 99 can do the job? And briefly, I wanted to mention that this is kind of very known, well known in computer vision world that, um, CNNs work or deep learning models work in general because of this overrepresentation uh, of um, features. So, um, and this figure on the right basically is summarizing that, you know, we have these 99 reproducible filters and the first layer, we can reduce the model to these, once we know these 99, we can make a model 
uh, that makes optimal prediction that we could achieve with all 300 filters. But there is no model where we start from a smaller number of filters as trained from a smaller number of filters that reaches this um, accuracy. So kind of over representation or over parameterization is an important feature in, in learning um, these models and having them being accurate. Um, okay, so the next question we can ask is, um, so we have all these uh, motifs, what do they correspond to? And one way to answer this is to go and uh, match them up with known transcription factors and um, known databases. So um, one known database, uh, for example, is um, SysBP. So what I'm showing you here is, again, these, um, now I'm only focus on, focusing on these 99 uh, motifs or filters that were um, reproducible. I'm showing you the information content and the uh, model's influence on the y-axis, and then color coding them by whether or not they were annotated um, as a known motif in a database like SysBP. And actually, this figure was really exciting to me because, um, you know, I, I at that time, just a few years ago, I realized that much of what we're learning is recovering what's known immunologically. So these are all major transcription factors that are known to be important in the immune system. And you might say, well, why do you find it exciting? This is all known. I find it exciting because this model didn't know about anything that was known. And on the base of you know, one data set and one model is recovering years and years of um, analysis of sequences and, and chip seek and, and so on. So, um, so while the majority of these um, kind of filters and, and motifs that we're finding are known, there are some that are unknown. Um, so an example here, and some of these were uh, further investigating, uh, which is um, not a stage that I would want to say anything about. Um, the other thing that we can do is uh, look at each of these filters, um, now that we can map to transcription factor, uh, known transcription factors, um, the ones that actually match to um, SysPP, and ask, so which cell type are they most important for? So this is basically influence of each filter on a cell type basis. Um, and again, um, just you know, eyeballing this figure, there are a lot of um, known um, properties that, that come up. Uh, so for example, PAX5 is known as a B cell regulator, and it's not, you know, not supposed to be active in all B cells, but a sub, uh, subset of um, B cells that we have. And that's uh, precisely what we see. Uh, we also have RNA-seq data, so we can go and uh, match up, you know, the model's prediction of where PAX5 is important, which cell type is important for, versus the RNA-seq um, expression of PAX5. And then we see that there is a pretty good correlation. So we can do this ex um, kind of experiment uh, more broadly for all these filters uh, that match to any known transcription uh, factor binding site. And if we do this, we see a picture like this. Um, where you know you should just pay attention to the red dots. Um, the gray dots are kind of like um, are null. Um, so for about thirty percent of these filters that we're finding that match up to known um, transcription factor binding site, they correlate um, well with the expression of the corresponding transcription factor. <clears throat> okay, so let me just see how much time we have. Okay, so we have a little bit. Um, uh, so. Um, the other kind of dissection that's intuitive and, and somewhat easy is to look at this last uh, embedding layer. So I mentioned that this basically last layer creates uh, an embedding or a representation of the sequences um, that is um, good for predicting activity profiles. So what does it actually look like? Uh, so we can visualize it with something like TSNI. Uh, so this is basically each dot here is one um, test sequence. Uh, and its projection in this um, embedding space by captured by the last um, layer of the neural network, last shared layer, I should say. Uh, and then we can you know, cluster it. Um, we can do different things with it. We can, uh, for instance, um, overlay data about um, the activity of each of these sequences across the different lineages that we have. And here we start to see also cool things that, um, you know, as expected, um, in peaks that are active and, and certain lineages are close by together. And, and you, know, you see that kind of a logical representation of where the different cell types um, are um, that depends on their lineage similarity. But there's also some um, other things that we can dive into further. Um, so for instance, uh, we see this um, ILC population. Um, so there are um, OCRs 
that are active in ILCs, and there seems to be a, a set of them that are separate from others. So we've been looking in these a little bit to see what makes these um, distinct and, and so on. So there's uh, lots of things to play with. Um, and okay, so uh, one of the last things that I wanted to leave you with was, so right up to now, you know, what I mostly talked about was um, looking at these first layer filters and trying to figure out what are the transcription factors uh, that are present and what are the motifs that we learn. Um, but um, the power of the model comes from being able to um, combinatorially, combinatorially use these um, individual filters or motifs to make final prediction. And um, I think uh, a lot of new insights can come from looking at these higher level interactions that were learned, um, which I'm not going to tell you too much about. What, what I wanted to tell you about is a clue of you know, how complex is um, regulatory code as learned, um, at least by this model. So one experiment that we can do is we can say for any given uh, input sequence, how many filters are needed to make the prediction as accurately as, as we do. Um, so this is um, kind of a summary of that experiment. So you can say how many filters um, are, you know, were, were necessary to make a prediction for a given OCR. And if you do this, um, you see, so for a vast majority of OCRs, uh, one or two filters um, were good, but there's also a substantial number that are much more that are much more complex. So sometimes five up to 10 different uh, filters were needed to make the predictions, meaning that probably there's a lot going on um, in terms of combinatorial um, regulation. Okay, so um, this sorry, is my last slide. Quick question yeah. about that last point. Um, sorry, I'm trying to go back. Yes. Great. Uh, so have you looked into sort of like which, um, basically any of the context of things that require more filters versus fewer filters uh, in relation to either genes and their expression across the different cell types or which cell types they're in or whether or not they're specifically versus ubiquitously active or mm -hmm. any, other, any other pieces like that? Yeah, it's really hard to characterize because there's so much, I feel like there's a lot, it's a complex reason why like the shape, this, the shape of this histogram is explained by a very um, kind of many different factors. Uh, but one thing that we do see is, um, yeah, the things that are here are more likely to be um, variable, like much more variable than, and than uh, things that are here. Good. But yeah, that's, uh, that's something that I think it's open and, and we're, we're looking into that more. And one thing that we're doing is actually you know, try to figure out exactly which OCRs are you know, reasonably predicted by a linear model versus which ones require a much more complex and then really dissecting the ones that require complexity. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll just leave you with a few kind of um, ongoing um, questions that I have. Um, and kind of the things that um, we're, we're investigating. Uh, so, you know, what I showed you in this model is that it kind of worked out that um, we dissected this model and realized that the first, first layer filters are representing known transcription factor binding site and it's all kind of making sense. It didn't have to be that way. And as it turns out, and now people know a lot more about this, is that um, certain setting of the parameters make uh, models learn um, things that are more biologically interpretable versus um, not. And um, there's a really nice um, piece of work here by um, you know, saying that depending on the specific for, uh, form of the activation function that you use, you end up, at least for this kind of task, learning um, partial motif versus um, more biologically interpretable motifs. And in our case, you know, we just use cross-validation to set our parameters, but it turned out that it was a setting that was actually resulted in, in interpretability, which is interesting. So on the topic of you know, figuring out higher level interactions, this is a very active area of research in machine learning, and there are you know, papers that are trying to do this, and it's, it's really hard. And in our context, what makes it hard is that um, the code, I would say, we have low statistical power. And by that, what I mean is that any given combination is going to be present only a few times. So we don't have these like, combinations that happen all over again. Um, but any given combination only appears a few times. And it's really hard to figure out um, how to like, extract signal in this low power setting. Um, the, kind of the, the other thing that we were thinking about is um, the sequence logic of variable OCR, which our model emphasized, 
but there's a whole class of more ubiquitous OCR that our model is not doing so well in predicting. And probably we, we need different kinds of loss function and different kind of setting to be able to capture those well. Um, and then some other um, areas that we're further investigating is how to go from these models are well-defined cell types to single cell um, ATAC seq. Um, and hopefully uh, with combination of you know, what we have and single cell ATAC seq, we can identify actual regulatory network differences uh, to that define um, discrete populations. Um, extracting feature interactions, as I mentioned, and uh, kind of the, the other thing that we're investigating is I, I mentioned a lot about se sequence similarity between uh, mouse and human, at least in terms of ability to make prediction from the same sequence. Um, but there are also differences and uh, kind of we're probing uh, that question by figuring out can neural network predict uh, which regulatory regions are coming from mouse and which in human and um, figuring out why they can make that kind of prediction. Okay, with that, I'll just end with acknowledgement. So uh, much of it was um, really close collaboration with the Benua lab um, and a postdoc there, um, Ricardo, um, lots of discussion with um, Jason, um, and also two very talented students uh, from my lab, Sasha, that used to be a master's student with me and now is a PhD student, and Mark Ma, that believe it or not, was an undergrad when he started this work and he was the one that got it off uh, the ground and running. So um, really talented students. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you all for listening.